yeah so before the break uh, we kind of started looking at the tactics which the enemy uses he no longer care, has legal authority so now he has to try and use illegal methods uh, to uh, you know cause us uh, to to stray away from god so we saw that one of the main tactics that he uses one of the main mind games that he uses is in the area of temptation he tries to find out which area we are weak in and he tries to tempt us in that particular area and then in the same way we also looked at how um, he tries to bring accusations against us because through those accusations his hope is that you know we will um, no longer feel confident in god's presence and we'll go away from god and hide somewhere you know so that uh, uh, that that deep connection which we have with the lord will be kind of broken so the aim aim of accusations is to make us feel very far away from god you know so that's the idea and um, so we saw that jesus in spite of knowing that we are imperfect people he has given us this new status as his friends and so even when we you know fail in some way even when we are not able to live up to god's standards we must remember that god is willing to forgive and he is uh, you know willing to restore us and so we continue he continues to see us as his friends he does not see us as worthless and someone that he's not interested in no he's very much interested in us to the extent that he has made us his uh, his friends um one very good example that we can look at uh, you know is the way uh, jesus um treated peter in spite of peter's failures uh, so if someone could read out matthew chapter 16 verse 19 matthew 16 19 Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven Okay so uh, this is Matthew 16 verse 19 just a few verses after this maybe verse 23 24 I'm not particularly sure um uh, is where Jesus tells you know Peter you're going to betray me and peter says no no way lord i'll never do that but the jesus says no you will betray me so to someone who is going to betray him this is what jesus says about him he says you know what i will be giving you the keys of the kingdom of heaven whatever you peter whatever you bind on earth it will be bound in heaven and whatever you you know you peter whatever you peter lose on this earth it will be loosed in heaven because over here that word you know uh, you i will give you it is second person singular it's talking specifically to one single person and the person that jesus is speaking to over here is peter so peter uh, so jesus fully knowing what peter is going to be doing in the near future even though jesus knows that this is what jesus personally says to peter specifically he says i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven because jesus is aware that peter will repent of his sin peter will be ashamed of what he has done and he, god uh, has, has already decided that he will restore peter back and peter will not just simply be restored he will walk in authority in such authority where he is able to bind and loose things in the spiritual realm that is the authority that we have in christ because over here in matthew 16 19 jesus says this specifically to peter but then in matthew 18 18 he says the same thing to all believers uh, so let's you know also look at matthew 18 18 Matthew 18 18 Truly I tell you whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven Over here the you which is used over here whatever you bind on earth this is second person plural 
So over here, Jesus is not just saying this to one person. He's in fact saying it to uh, multiple people. So it applies to all believers. So this is the status that we have in God. So even though Satan may come and accuse us and say, oh, because you are not a perfect person, you have no value in God's eyes. No, you are so valuable that God has placed in your hands the keys of the kingdom. You can deal with these principalities and powers in the name of Jesus. You can bind and loose things in the name of Jesus, and Jesus will back you up. That is your status. You are a friend of God. So even though you are imperfect, it doesn't change the facts about your status and who you are in Christ. So we need to understand this. And so we use the word of our testimony and declare these truths to Satan and say, no, I refuse to believe your lie that I have no value or worth in God's eyes. In the same way, when Satan comes and accuses and says, you know, you failed in all of these things. This is the way that you sinned against God. This is the way you betrayed him. And so we can again take the scripture and say in the same way that when Peter repented, God forgave him and placed in his hands the keys of the kingdom in the same way. Because I have repented of those sins, God has forgiven me. I stand forgiven. And now in my hands, God has placed the keys of the kingdom. And so in Jesus name, I can bind your work, Satan. You know, you can, like, you can literally hit back with the authority that you have in Jesus Christ. Rather than being, you know, feeling crushed and ashamed and, you know, slinking away, feeling defeated, you can actually hit him back with scripture and say, because of the authority given in my name, I can bind your works against me in Jesus' name and cancel them because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, that work of the cross will prevail. So when Satan attacks as an accuser, we can overcome him by the blood of the lamb which basically represents the finished work of the cross and we can uh, overcome by the word of our testimony by declaring what god has done for us and the sta status that we now have you know in the name of jesus so um, the mind games that satan plays with us he tries to tempt us in an area of weakness uh, when we are vulnerable at some point of time he attacks um, he also tries to accuse us so that you know we will feel very ashamed and go far away from God. He also tries to deceive us. He brings in half truths. Partially what he is saying is true, but it's not completely true. So using these half truths, he tries to deceive us. And this is what 2 Corinthians 11.3 says. Uh, if someone could read out for us 2 Corinthians 11.3. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear that somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his fasting, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, yeah. So, in the version which she read out, uh, which Jeffina read out, it says that you will be led away. You know, he says, I'm worried that you will be led away from the simplicity you know, of your faith in uh, Christ. In NIV, it says, you know, uh, that he is worried that they would be led astray uh, from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So that simplicity over there, it's talking about, you know, a very simple, pure, completely, you know, trusting, childlike faith and devotion to Christ. If Jesus says something, you just believe and say, okay, Lord, you're saying that, I believe it. No, a very simple, dedicated, pure, faith that we have in Christ. So what does Satan do? He tries to draw us away from that faith by putting doubts in our mind, which is what he did in the case of Eve. Um, so um, Eve says to him very confidently, no, 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 if we eat that fruit, we will die. It's a very dangerous thing. And then what does Satan say? He says in verse, you know, Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. Yeah, maybe we can actually read that. Uh, Genesis 3, verses 4. 4 to 6, if someone could read out. Genesis 3, 4 to 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. Then the serpent said to the women, you will not surely die. 
but god knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like god knowing good and evil so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and she desired of it to make one wise she took off its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her and he and he ate so over here the doubt which satan puts in their minds is that no 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 you will not die god is lying why is god lying because he doesn't want you to be like him it says you will be like god if you eat it so the doubt which was put in uh, adam and eve's mind is that oh if we uh, god is not giving us the best he's holding out he's not giving us what is best in a way he's deceived us so he's he he said to us we are made in this image and we are like him and all of that he said but actually it looks like he's not really revealed his knowledge you know uh, to us and so uh, the woman she looks at the fruit and she and she thinks it is desirable for gaining wisdom so now she begins to believe satan's lie that if she eats that fruit she will somehow gain access to some level of wisdom which will make her as wise as god the point is in god she already had all the wisdom she would ever require for every situation in her life god had not deprived her in any way you know she had been created to be the ruler you know to be to rule over the earth she and her husband would be ruling over the earth so whatever wisdom they required to name the animals to be able to rule over those animals all of that wisdom had already been given they had not been deprived of anything but now she thinks oh god is holding back something is not really given us the best so if i eat this then maybe i will get that thing so they are misled and led away from the sincere and pure simple devotion which they earlier had towards god and uh, so satan tries to use the same tactic with us he he tries to tell us that god is not giving us the best if we were to sin if we were to compromise then we will be able to get something that god is refusing to give so in our wisdom you know in our god given scriptural wisdom we should say uh, if god is at the moment depriving me of something is depriving me of it by his wisdom because it's good for me it is safe for me not to have this thing right now so we choose to just humbly wait upon god to give us whatever it is that we are desiring rather than you know sinning rather than bending the rules and going against god and getting that thing forcefully we instead must choose to just trust him continue having that simplicity of devotion you know where you just simply continue to trust him and say in god's timing he will give me what is required so we choose not to uh, to to resort to sin uh you know to to get illegally what god has not given us so we do not you know fall in to that particular tactic um so um you know which is what we saw even in roman 16 17 to 20 where it talks about you no know, uh, be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil um over there in uh, you know if you if you were to go to roman 16 uh, maybe uh you could read out verse 18 roman 16 18 roman 16 18 for such people are not serving our lord jesus our lord christ but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the minds of yeah of people. Na naive people um so these people are naive as in they are innocent is a positive word naive is a negative word um innocent as in you're choosing to you know keep yourself away from things which are not good so that's a good innocence naivety on the other hand is like you know a little foolish you better be wise about certain things but you know in your foolishness you have not chosen to educate yourself regarding those things so in a way it's a, a to being naive is a negative thing so these people are being foolish they have not bothered to build themselves up in the scripture um you know they've not bothered to really find out what is there in the pages of their bible and so now when this you know false teachers are coming and giving them all kinds of uh, false doctrines 
so easily so naively so foolishly they are being led away in the wrong direction if they had bothered to educate themselves in the scriptures they would not have fallen so easily so uh, you know over here um, the advice that is given in romans 16 uh, 17 to 20 you know uh, paul says it uh, you you should be wise about what is good and you should be innocent about what is evil if you have that kind of an attitude then god himself will crush satan under your feet so when uh, satan comes to us us with half truths it sounds kind of truthful but there's deception in in what he is saying so rather than you know listening to what he is saying we choose to stand on the 100% word of god rather than the half truth which he is giving you know which is just 50% true we choose to stand on scripture which is 100% true and we say no what you are saying is only half true and so i will not be led away i will not be deceived i'll just continue to just in in all simplicity continue to believe what scripture is saying what you are saying may sound more logical but i will choose to be wise in a godly way and rather believe what the scripture is saying rather than you know the logical reasoning which you are trying to offer so in in we continue to maintain that simplicity of devotion like little children you know um you know you 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 tell the you you, you know you tell the little child you know uh, at at you know at 12 o'clock i will give you juice the child just believes the child doesn't think oh will she really give me the juice oh maybe she will you know i have other work to do and she'll go away the child doesn't think that the child just believes children are innocent they just place this beautiful trust in what we say and here god says have that same kind of simplicity of devotion if i'm saying something in my scripture accept it believe it don't believe in satan who will come to you with half truths and try to indicate that the scripture is not really that correct don't give in to that kind of a deception so be wise about what is good and be innocent about the evil which he is trying to put into your head and if you are careful in this manner you know the promise is that god himself will crush satan under your feet uh, so we choose to continue to hold on to what the scripture is saying um maybe another important scripture that we can look at you know in this particular context would be acts 17 11 to 12 acts 17 11 to 12 Acts seventeen, eleven and twelve. Now the Bidian, uh, Bidian Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. now uh, the gospel was being shared to different people groups so when the gospel was being shared to these people you know these jews who are in beria they went back to the scriptures every day you know uh, so they would probably go to the synagogue and look at the scrolls which are over there just to make sure whether what paul is saying is really correct or not they didn't just simply blindly accept what he was saying they went over there To the, you know at that in those days they didn't have any personal copies of the scriptures in their homes uh, so they would they must have taken the effort to actually go over there to, to to the synagogue sit over there open the scrolls find out whether what this man is saying is really true or not is jesus christ really fulfilling all of those old testament scriptures what exactly are those old testament scriptures saying about christ so they began to open the scriptures and started to see what is the scripture saying about the messiah and then they began to realize oh my goodness everything that the old testament is saying about the messiah we are seeing those realities in the life of jesus so this must be true so maybe jesus really you know truly is the messiah so um so they examined the scriptures and they held on to the truth so it will be will be led away by satan's half truths if we are not educating ourselves in the scriptures we have um, i mean whether we are bible college students or whether you know we are just people in the secular field every christian 
has you know every nobody has an excuse we all need to know what is written in the pages of the bible if we are not very clear about the truths which are written down over there we will be misled by satan because he will he will speak a half truth he will speak the half which you know and then he the other half he will you know tell some word of deception and because you only have half knowledge you will give in to what he is saying you will doubt what your lord and savior has written in, in the scriptures so it is so important for us to be very very aware of what is there in the scriptures to learn and meditate on on the on, on the word of god and know what is actually written regarding every matter you know in the uh, bible so we looked at um, um we looked at the mind games which satan uses uh, we will also now look at another way that satan attacks us uh, which is in the form of violations and intrusions uh, so um if we could read out first peter 5 verse 8 first peter 5 8 First Peter five eight, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, around prowls prowl, around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The word which we in English are translating as devil, uh, the Greek word actually literally means enemy, adversary, opponent. You know, someone who's against us, someone who's opposing us, someone who wants to harm us. So that word. we you know in english which we use devil the greek word actually means adversary or opponent or an enemy so this opponent this enemy he's always prowling around to see in what way he can you know finish us off literally devour us and finish us off uh, that is what he's looking for and john 10 10 which we are very familiar with it talks about how the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy on the other hand jesus came that we may have life and not just any kind of life but to have it you know in the full so um, so the opponent the enemy the devil his main uh, hope is that he can in some way steal and kill and destroy what god has in you know in store for us so when uh, the devil comes to us you know as our adversary the weapon that we choose to use against him is the weapon of the name of jesus the authority that there is in the name of jesus we use that to cancel the works of satan because jesus christ has done something um, uh, he has won the ultimate victory on the cross so we claim that victory and we make it ours by using the name of jesus so in jesus name we cancel the works of satan and we claim the works of the cross that's basically you know um in how we use the name of jesus as a weapon um uh if we can look at first john 38 uh yeah first john 38 First John three eight, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So the Son of God appeared to destroy the devil's work, and on the cross he actually finished destroying the devil's work. You know, and we saw that in the earlier scripture where it talks about how. But he are after having destroyed the devil's work he took away the power uh, you know which these powers and authorities you know whatever uh, legal uh, authority they had he took it away from them so he has finished destroying the devil's works now because of what jesus christ has done we can now use the authority that is there in his name uh, luke 10:17 if someone could read out luke 10:17 Luke 10:17 The 72 returned with joy and said Lord even the demons submit to us in your name So why are the demons submitting to mere human beings 
because these mere human beings are using the name of Jesus and the authority that is contained in that name. So this Jesus, he came to destroy the devil's work. So Jesus has finished destroying the devil's work. So when we take the name of Jesus, we are literally taking all that he has finished on the cross. And we are saying, you know what? This is what Jesus did for us. So now, because of the cross, Satan, whatever tactic and scheme you're trying to, you know, uh, use, that is actually, I can actually cancel it out. And I can declare Jesus' work on the cross, you know, above what you are doing. So we cancel the works of the evil one and we claim the works of the cross. So we cancel out one and we, in its place, we impose by faith what God has done for us. Okay, so this is an act of faith that we are doing. And when we are doing it knowledgeably, not just because someone told us you should use the name of Jesus, but we actually understand what we are doing, we can have extremely great authority. Because when we look at Satan working in our home, you know, bringing about um, some kind of strife or division, you say, I recognize what you are doing, Satan. You have violated and intruded, you know, into our home. And now you're trying to use this tactic to, you know, uh, to destroy our family. But you know what? There's a greater work that was done on the cross. So in Jesus name, I cancel out what you are trying to do. And in Jesus name, I claim what Christ did for us because he has defeated all of your works. So what you are trying to do in our home shall not prevail. Rather, I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to ask from the Lord to restore the relationships in our home. I'm going to ask, uh, wait upon the Lord and ask him to bring his peace into our lives. I'm going to wait upon the Lord and ask him to bring about the transformation you know, uh, in, 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 in our family members so that we can become more like Christ. So I'm going to claim in prayer all that Christ has done on the cross for us. And that is why boldly right now in Jesus name, I cancel your work, Satan. What you're trying to do will not prevail. Rather, what God has done on the cross will prevail because me and my family, we are going to claim this in Jesus name and he will grant it to us. So whatever tactic and scheme Satan tries to use against us and our families by violating, by intruding into our lives, we can always cancel out those works of the devil in the name of Jesus because of what Jesus has finished doing for us. And so we can declare and say the greater work of the cross that will prevail in this situation, not the tactics of Satan, not the work of Satan that will be canceled out. Rather, what Jesus has done, that finished work is what will prevail, the superior work of Christ. That is what will prevail in this situation. We declare it aloud in faith and then we pray it till we see it happening. So, um, you know, we don't give up after a little bit of prayer. We pray through, we hold on until we see that actual manifestation of that finished work, you know, in our situation, in our lives. Why? Because we know that this is the fact, this is the truth, this is what Jesus has finished doing for us. So we can, uh, in Jesus' name, come against the works of the evil one and cancel them. Because like it says in Luke 10, 17, the demons will have to submit to the name of Jesus. They do not have a choice because, uh, you know, legally, now Jesus has won the victory for us and legally, the demons no longer have any power. They have been stripped of their power, uh, is what we saw in Colossians. Uh, so so these are, these are all the spiritual facts that we use you know, to fight our battle. Um, a third manner in which um, you know, Satan can attempt to gain control over us is through the uh, doors which we open up by mistake. You know, we do something sinful by doing that sinful thing we open a door for him to come into our lives and gain a foothold. So we should always be alert, very careful. On a daily basis, we need to examine ourselves and ask, have I done something today 
uh, you know, which is sinful? Have I in some way gone out of the covering? You know, I'm no longer under the covering of Jesus' protection. I have gone out and done something sinful. Have I exposed myself to danger in some way? Have I given Satan a foothold? Um, so we'll just look at maybe a couple of scripture passages, you know, which talk about how we may end up, you know, exposing ourselves to the danger which Satan brings and what we need to do, you know, to overcome uh, in those circumstances. Now, of course, you know, open doors can be opened up in all kinds of ways. Uh, there are so many things that a person can do to end up exposing themselves to the harm uh, of Satan. Uh, but, you know, we can we'll just look at a couple of scriptures. Um, you know, regarding this. Uh, so the first, we are looking at two passages which are almost identical, which are almost saying the very same thing. And both the passages try to bring out one or two main points, you know, which is why we are kind of focusing on these particular uh, passages. So to begin with, uh, we will look at James chapter 4, uh, verses 4 to 10. Uh, James chapter 4, verses 4 to 10. And um, maybe, um, yeah, we need to understand the background of this, right? So, OK, fine. Uh, if someone could read out James chapter 4, uh, verses 4, 5. Um, OK, James chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. If, so, if you could please read out James 4, 4 to 7. James chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace that is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. All right. So uh, now let's look at another passage, uh, you know, and then we will compare. Uh, th this other passage is 1 Peter 5, and maybe, fine, we will look at 1 uh, Peter 5. Verses 5 to 8. First Peter 5, 5 to 8. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 to 8. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may be. Yeah, and then it goes on to say in verse 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith. You know, so um, there are a lot of similarities between these two passages. Um, in James chapter 4, it is talking about the danger have, of having friendship with the world. Because if you start getting friendly with the world, if you start uh, you know, uh, doing the things which the world is doing, then it says you automatically become an enemy of God. Okay, So one way that you're opening the door to Satan is if you are foolish enough to start befriending the world. You start doing what the world is doing. When you do that, automatically you become an enemy of God and you expose yourself to the danger of, uh, you know, of Satan coming in and harming you. Um, so James 4, is, uh, the focus is on don't uh, you know, be part of the world. Don't make friendship with the world. Don't love the things which the, wor you know, which, which the world loves. And over here in 1 Peter 5, the emphasis is on uh, submission to spiritual authority. You know the the setup over here is of a church. Uh, that that the, you know it's, it's it's a church setup that is being discussed over here, and uh, believers are told to submit to the authority of the elders who have been appointed. Uh, and so over here it says, you know, you know, you need to humble yourself and learn to submit to elders. So in both the passages, 
this is the same point which is made uh, in James chapter 4, verse 6. It says, why should you not make friendship with the world? Why should you be careful to stay away from the world? Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. In the same way over here in 1 Peter 5, um, verse uh, 5, why should you submit to authority? Uh, why? Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So in both places, how do you stay under God's protection? You choose to humble yourself and do what scripture is telling you to do. In one case, it is, of course, avoiding the friendship with the world. In the other case, it is submitting to authority. In both cases, you are choosing to humble yourself and place yourself under what God is telling you to do. When you do that, the door is not opened to Satan. Okay, And you are able to stay safe. And the same thing is uh, again repeated in both the passages. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Okay, and in uh, in the first Peter passage, it says in uh, first Peter 5, verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. So submit to him, humble yourself and uh, you know under him. Why is this word humble, you know, humbling yourself and God favors the humble? Why is the term being used? Because it's going to be difficult. You see, your mind is going to be saying, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, you know, uh, God's standards, you know, are too, um, are too difficult to follow. Uh, he's not being very logical about this. Why is he expecting me to uh, have to, you know, humble myself in this way? I don't feel like doing it. So everything in us is rebelling against this idea. But in spite of what we are feeling, we choose to humble ourselves and place ourselves, like it says in 1 Peter 5, under God's mighty hand. We say, okay, Lord, this is not agreeing with me, but I will choose to humble myself and place myself under your covering. Why? Because it says in 1 Peter 5, verse 6, that he may lift you up in due time. You know, when you're humbling yourself under God's mighty hand, it may feel like a very painful thing to do, but that mighty hand is going to lift you up when the time comes. So it's a temporary thing. For a temporary period, you know, God says, you know, okay, this temptation is coming to you. You want to befriend the world. You want to, you know, make friendship with the world in this particular thing, but don't. Just humble yourself under my, my mighty hand. And it may feel like a very painful thing that you are doing. In the same way, you know, God may be saying, you know, you have to submit to spiritual authority. You may not feel like it, but humble yourself under my, my, my mighty hand and do this. Because when you do that, that same mighty hand, you know, which you feel like as if it's very heavy right now, that same mighty hand will lift you up out of that situation. You know, once God has finished doing whatever work he wants to do in your heart. So he will lift you up. So with this attitude of submission, in both the passages, it says, resist the devil. In James chapter 4, it says in verse 7, it says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And in the first Peter 5 passage, it says that in verse 8, it says, resist him, standing firm in the faith. So what are we learning from these two passages? When you choose to humble yourself and do what God is telling you to do, rather than being proud and rebellious and saying, you know, this doesn't feel right. I don't feel like doing this. Rather than responding in that manner, when we humble ourselves and place ourselves under God, then it says that you know we will be able to resist the devil. There will be no open doors. There will be no foothold. He will not be able to gain a foothold. When we act in rebellion and bitterness towards God and say, ha, look, look at the way God is treating me. Look at the way things are going in my life. The minute we do that, Satan gains a foothold in our life. It's like an open door. So it is so careful to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, no matter what that mighty hand of God is doing to us, if we just choose to humble ourselves and obey what he is saying and choose to continue trusting him, then his mighty hand will lift us up when the right time comes. You know, which is why it says in the First Peter 5 passage, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 
you know, and then it says in First Peter 5, verse 10, it says, after you have suffered a little while, uh, he himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So open doors, the danger of open doors. Satan tries to gain some kind of a foothold in your life, either because you are disobeying something or because you are, you know, um, not uh, agreeing with God with what God is saying and you want to do your own thing. So he will try to use these methods of trying to gain some kind of a foothold in your life. And if we choose not to give in, if we choose to stay humble and trust God, then in that way, we will be able to resist the devil and the devil will have no choice. He will actually have to flee from us. That is the assurance that we are given. And after God has finished doing whatever work he wants to do in us, it says he himself will lift us up. He will restore us. He will make us strong and firm and steadfast. So this is the assurance that we can have, you know, in the Lord. Coming to the next point, you know, about overcoming the, uh, the devil, it says be vigilant and give the enemy no opportunity. Now, you know, this is similar to what we, you know, already looked at. But then, you know, we look at some other scriptures, some additional scriptures about not giving the enemy any opportunity. You know, the, the main scripture which comes to mind is the way Cain responded, uh, you know, and this is what God says to Cain before, you know, he falls into uh, sin. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Genesis 4, 6 to 7. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at, your, at the door, and a desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Okay, so the sin is always crouching at the door. It always wants to get an opportunity to overpower us. but we choose not to listen to it. We choose not to give in to it. We choose to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. So we, we and so in by doing that, by humbling ourselves under God's mighty hand, we choose to rule over this sin. So this is what you know. Um, the Lord says to Cain, He says, "If you do what is right, will you not be accepted?" So you know, I'm I'm trying to correct you regarding some particular matter over here. So if you just accept what I am saying, and if you humble yourself and you know submit to what I am saying, then you will be able to rule over the sin which is crouching at your door. On the other hand, if you don't humble yourself and accept what I am saying, there's great danger that sin which is crouching at the door, it's going to come inside and it's going to overpower you. So the key to uh, you know ruling over sin, the key to ruling and having authority over Satan is to accept what Jesus is saying and humbling ourselves under his mighty hand. So in that way, we don't give the enemy any opportunity to overpower us. Um, you know, John 14, 30. Um, uh, this is what Jesus says. Uh, if someone could read out John 14, 30. John chapter 14 verse 13 and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the father may be glorified in the uh, I I may have got the reference wrong or you might have read out the wrong scripture John 14 13 30 oh, 30 I read 13 okay. okay 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 yeah John 14 verse 13 I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in him. He has nothing in me. He has no hold over me. You know, NIV gives a more clear uh, interpretation of that. Satan has no hold over me. Jesus says that because Jesus never sinned. Jesus never gave in to any temptation. So Satan could not get a foothold at all. So uh, the, the enemy had no opportunity to you know, destroy his life in any way. Um, so, uh, so Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross. You know, and over there on the cross, I will be, uh, I will, um, you know, so much, so, so many destructive things are going to happen. But the thing is, the truth is, 
Satan has absolutely no hold over me. And that can be the same thing even for us. You see, if we are humbling ourselves under God's hand in the same way Jesus Christ humbled himself under God's hand, you know, Jesus had not done anything sinful. And yet he chose to humble himself under the mighty hand of God and went through that whole crucifixion process. Because he did that, you know, he could come out victorious. Sin could not gain any hold over him. In the same way, we too can rule over sin and we can defeat Satan. How? By, you know, um, being that obedient, by humbling ourselves and trusting in our God and doing whatever he is telling. When we do that, then sin can have no hold over us. The prince of this world can have no hold over us. He will not be able to bring harm into our lives. He will not be able to steal, kill and destroy. And we will be able to walk in victory. So just for us to be alert, you know, Satan, of course, can attacks from a whole number of different directions. But, you know, just to keep some particular scriptures in mind about how the enemy, you know, just some examples of how the enemy tries to gain a foothold. Uh, the first scripture that we see is Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. If someone could read out Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So one, one way in which Satan can gain a foothold is when we deal with our anger in the wrong manner. We all get angry. Uh, and sometimes we are justified in getting angry because we are getting angry about something wrong that is being done. So we are justified in being angry. But are we expressing that anger in a godly manner, in a, in a right way? Or are we expressing it in a wrong way? So when we are angry, if we allow that to grow into a grudge, if we don't allow, if we don't clear the air, you know, and discuss things with the other person, if we don't, you know, go halfway and meet that person halfway, you know, say, I'm willing to change this, this from my side, you know, uh, so we are, we should be willing to, you know, humble ourselves and, and do whatever we can from our side to maintain the peace. If we are not doing all of this, if we don't resolve that, that issue and it continues to grow in our heart, then Satan can gain a foothold. So how we deal with the anger, the sooner we attempt to maintain peace with, it, with that other person, the sooner we are willing to forgive the other person, the sooner we are willing to make adjustments, the less the danger of Satan gaining a foothold. Another important scripture to keep in mind would be 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. When we are not honoring God with our bodies, that really gives Satan a chance to you know, uh, take control of us. So when it says honoring uh, God with our bodies, you know, what are we watching with our eyes? Satan can easily gain a foothold in our lives if we are entertaining the wrong things with our eyes you know our ears are we listening to people who are saying all the wrong things gossipy things things which are pulling down people are we listening to the wrong kind of music which which dishonors god's values so how are we using our bodies you know if we are not using our bodies very carefully in a way that will honor god that gives satan a foothold so uh, that's a very, very important th thing to keep in mind. Another uh, very useful scripture would be James 3.16. James 3.16. James 3.16. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Ambition. It's good to be ambitious. I mean, there's nothing wrong in being ambitious. If you remember, you know, uh, David, when he goes to, uh, you know, defeat Goliath, he says, you know, how can this, uh, you know, this person speak against God? 
you know so he is very very angry for god you know he he says this this foolish you know giant is uh, speaking bad things about god and he's speaking bad things about the people of god so someone should go and defy him so over there his main interest is that god's name should be glorified so he goes to fight against goliath with a right attitude but he's also an ambitious young man so he says you know if i defeat goliath what's going to be given to me what reward is going to come to me so there's no harm in being ambitious but how are we exercising that ambition you know are we allowing jealousy and greed to creep into our lives are we trying to you know getting getting overly competitive and trying to pull down others now if our ambition is being expressed in all the wrong manners it gives satan a very very strong foothold so um, you know it is so important it is good to be ambitious but how are we you know working towards those ambitions are we using godly methods to reach those goals or are we using you know um, worldly methods to reach those goals because that can give satan a foothold okay so these are some some things that we uh, looked at uh, to make sure uh, that the enemy does not get any opportunity to harm us in any way so we'll have to stop over here because you know we are out of time uh, but we'll um, look at a few more things that can help us in overcoming the devil uh, so uh, there just a few more points and then we will you know uh, kind of get into the final chapter all right so we will we'll do all of that in next class let's just close with a very brief word of prayer thank you so much o lord for the lessons that we could learn today uh, regarding overcoming the uh, the world and overcoming the devil we pray o lord that you would bring back these important points to our mind if you could bring back all the scriptures to our mind whenever we need them because o lord ultimately it is through the word of god and the holy spirit that we are sanctified and set apart so whenever o lord we are facing temptation whenever we are facing a trial you o lord bring the right scripture to our mind and you o lord help us by your power to humble ourselves and submit and obey so that in your perfect time you can lift us up o lord and satan will be crushed o lord thank you o lord that you will do all this for us even as we completely depend upon you thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you so much for you know uh, listening right up to the end and yeah we'll meet again next class Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.